In this video, I claim that consciousness is a trace property over Petronet. But to understand this sentence, it's easier to first understand that traffic lights are a trace property over automata. But what do these terms mean? And how do we even define words in the first place again? Don't we normally just point at things? For example, this is a blueberry muffin. And this is a chihuahua. And this is a scone. And this is another chihuahua. Over time, you should be able to identify which pictures contain chihuahuas and which pictures contain confectionaries. Let's do the same thing with bikinis. This is a bikini. This is also a bikini. This is a bikini. And this is also a bikini. Seems simple enough. But, oh no, what if a part of the bikini goes missing? Is this remaining piece still a bikini? No worries, ladies, says Ludwig Wittgenstein. Let's just call it the bottom part of a bikini. Everyone knows what is meant and there will be no confusion. Meaning is use, after all. All of academia and the ladies loved him for freeing them from meaningless debates, except for some pervert philosophers. Hmm, that's a weak cop-out, my student. We still don't know what a bikini really is. But sometimes, pervert philosophers are right. Definitions can still be vital. Suppose we were to define traffic lights by pointing at them. This is a traffic light, this is a traffic light, and this is a traffic light. And this, and maybe this as well, but I'm never sure if I have to include it or not, since part of the traffic light still barely touches the other image, but okay. Now, in an ideal country, this might work. But let's take a look at the UK. Specifically, take this busy crossing in Chelsea, London, right next to the Battersea Bridge. I can see a traffic light right here, but I need to guess when it is safe for me to cross. The cars don't care. If it's green, they drive, and if it's red, they don't. Mm, maybe now it is a safe time to cross the road? Oh, look, here you even have a pedestrian road sign. Good. It turned green. I think I can cross. Oh, fuck, this car almost hit me. I hope this shows that pointing is not quite enough for definitions. And we can agree that this is in fact a broken traffic light system. But the TFL in London seems to think otherwise. For, what, 18 years now? Surely. You must be joking. Anyways, I hope this shows that pointing is not quite enough for definitions. TFL cannot just wave and say, well, this is a valid traffic light system, because, well, there it is. In a similar way, the term consciousness cannot be defined by pointing alone. We can say that this, this, and that is conscious, whereas these things are not. But it gets more difficult with small animals or machines that seem to be somewhere in the middle. An animal having consciousness has serious ethical implications. If lobster pain is merely an unconscious reflex and stress reaction, then killing lobsters by throwing them in hot water should not be a problem. Whereas if a lobster experiences a conscious inner sensation of pain, we should introduce more laws protecting them. For this reason, Switzerland outlawed cooking lobsters alive in hot water, but they don't really know if they are conscious of the pain. This French writing automata from 1773 is not conscious, but I would not blame someone for believing it was for being able to write in an age where less than half of the population could read. Today, we have robots that mimic every muscle in our face with powerful, language processing systems behind them, and we can easily get tricked into believing that these machines are conscious. We all know what it feels like to be conscious right now, but the more we rely on machines to fulfill certain aspects of our mind, like relying on pictures instead of our own memory, and relying on calculators instead of calculating in our head, maybe we should make sure we don't gradually, accidentally, 
lose consciousness through this replacement procedure. So, for all of these reasons, I think we need a better definition of consciousness than merely pointing at them and saying, this is conscious, as it's done in the Turing test. So let's get to the main claim of the video. Consciousness is a trace property over Petrinets. But in order to understand these words, I think it is easier to first understand the sentence traffic lights are a trace property over automata. So, how do traffic lights work again? Traffic lights usually have a timer. If the timer runs out, the light switch from say red to red yellow. After this switch, a new timer is started, and when it runs out, the light switches from red yellow to green, from green to yellow, and from yellow to red, starting over. Let's call the sequence of light events a trace. The trace describes the effect of the system. In a four-way intersection, you have at least four traffic lights and another four pedestrian traffic lights. In this case, a trace consists of a sequence of eight lights. These traces are generated from microcontrollers in the traffic light system, running some type of automata. A very simplified automata can be described as follows. But if you want a more efficient traffic light system that takes into account pedestrian traffic and say pedestrian input through buttons to optimize traffic, the system will become much more complicated. We can, however, ignore the complexity of the implementation and simply focus on the trace that the microcontroller generates. If the possible traces fulfill all the necessary criteria of a valid traffic light system, the system is a valid traffic light system. One such property is that it is always the case that eventually light one will turn green. Similarly, it is always the case that eventually light 2 will turn green, and so on. These properties are called the liveness properties, by the way, because these cannot be disproven by any finite trace, i.e. they stay alive. It's always possible that after a finite trace of light 1 staying red, that the traffic system turns light 1 green again. Further, there are safety properties. These can be disproven by a finite trace. For example, Whenever light 1 is green or yellow, light 2 must be red, preventing a collision. If this ever happens, we have a finite trace from the start configuration until the safety criteria stops holding. The notation I use to describe these properties is a temporal logic. Specifically, I use linear temporal logic. We could implement more difficult properties using other temporal logics, like saying that light 1 must turn green within the next 2 minutes. Finally, you can add all these properties into one large property using conjunction and claim that every trace of an automata that fulfills these properties is a valid traffic light system. Given the code of a microcontroller that implements a traffic light system, we can check this property using a model checker like SPIN or TLA plus for all possible traces of the system. Anyhow, I hope you understand the following sentence now. Traffic lights are a trace property over automata. We don't have to talk about implementations to understand what a valid traffic light system is. We only need to talk about the trace of the implementation. In a similar way, we don't really need to know how the brain is wired in order to define consciousness. But once we did, we can then analyze a trace of an implementation and see if it fulfills consciousness properties. But brains are not implemented through automata. One abstraction is that of a network of electrical switches. However, this does not quite do the brain justice. For example, in order to predict the behavior of a single neuron, researchers at the Hebrew University had to set up an electrical circuit of 1000 switches in order to obtain the same complexity with 99% accuracy. To be on the safe side, we can go a level deeper and look at the chemical reactions of the neurons. Petri nets are machines that can model chemical processes. Petri nets consist of circles and squares, where the circles in this case indicate a molecule and squares indicate a possible reaction. Adding a dot in the circle indicates a single element of the respective molecule. If the incoming edges of a square in a petri net all have a molecule, 
the reaction can happen and the dots are transformed into a carbon dioxide molecule in this case. Because of this reaction, a new square is ready and can perform its reaction, which is then again transformed into water, natrium chloride and carbon dioxide. The carbon dioxide is fed back into the reaction again. In practice, these petri nets are used to simulate starch breakdown in potatoes, simulating aptosis in mammalian cells and many other reactions in a software called Snoopy, developed at the Brandenburger University. You can imagine creating much more complex machines like this, modeling the human brain, but again, the implementation does not really matter here. Instead, we need to agree on trace properties of this machine that describe consciousness. The trace of a Petri net consists of the number of elements contained in each circle during each execution step. Note that in this Petri net, some circles are displayed multiple times for ease of reading. But Petri nets do not just limit us to molecules. We can also implement our beloved traffic lights using Petri nets. The following is a simple two-way traffic light where at most one light may be green. The circles with the name all have a function that is triggered if an element resides in it. For example, right now in circle red 1 there is an element, meaning lamp 1 is red, and similarly lamp 2 is red. Let's throw an element into the middle circle to get the traffic light started and record its trace on the side. Please quickly think whether this system satisfies all of the traffic light properties. Well, it does not really. It is possible, though very unlikely, that it only loops on the left side on light 1 and never turns on light 2. Therefore, the liveness property, it is always the case that eventually light 2 will turn green, could be violated. You can pause the video to try to fix this traffic light system on your own. OK, done. One way you can fix this issue is by forcing the element to switch sides without letting it choose. Note that compared to automata, where a single state dictates the state of all traffic lights simultaneously, here you have one state that represents just one part of the trace. I don't need to check the entire system to see if traffic light 1 is green. This is much closer to how our brain models consciousness, where we know that certain parts in the brain light up when recognizing a face for example. I don't think it is a stretch to imagine that it is possible to implement the entire brain in an admittedly huge petri net. Now all we need to do then is find the trace properties of consciousness in an objective way. First, we need to define possible states of consciousness, like being able to hallucinate a remembered experience, intuitively solving an optimization problem, and so on. Next, we need to map configurations of molecules of the brain i.e. circles containing elements in the petri net, to states of consciousness, the same way we map the state of the petri net to lights in a traffic light system. Both of these should be doable and are in fact done. Phenomenologists and psychonauts are creating better and better models of possible states of consciousness, whereas neuroscientists map conscious states to areas in the brain, through patients that have missing brain regions or other methods. Now, as a computer scientist, I'm more interested in being able to remove the implementation layer, say that of a human brain, and be able to swap it out with another implementation, whether this is a petri net, an artificial neural network, or even a student executing a program on a piece of paper, doesn't really matter. In a petri net, states are the molecules at a given time. In a neural network, states are the activations at a given execution step. And in the student running a program, it is the state he has written with a pencil on a piece of paper. 
The only thing I need to provide is a translation mechanism from states in the trace of the implementation to states of consciousness. As long as such a translation exists, I can then verify if the implementation is able to create a conscious trace or not. I can also verify whether the implementation always creates a conscious trace. However, in order to make sure that the system is not conscious, I have to check every possible translation of states to conscious states and make sure that every translation is not conscious. I even have the feeling that there might be a property of consciousness, that consciousness is built in such a way that if one translation is conscious, all the other translations are as well. But that's just speculation. Now, I know I haven't given you a precise property of consciousness, and I have not provided you with an implementation of such a consciousness generating program, but I at least hope that you don't look for consciousness in a piece of code, but instead try to find consciousness in an execution trace of such a code. If you liked the video, make sure to also check out the series Daemonic Foundations, where I mention how we slowly transfer mental abilities from our mind into the external world. Thank you.